you have a Bible, please turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning verse 1. We'll read the first 14 verses, 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. This is towards the center of the Old Testament, if you're following in a pew Bible, it's on page 307. If you're visiting with us and you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles we'd love to give you. We've got free Bibles in the back, and you can use them now, take them with you as you go, our gift to you. The book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings, believe it or not, it's right after 1 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel, they came out to Elisha and they said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, yes, I know it, but keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho, they drew near to Elisha and they said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And Elisha answered, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan River. Then Elijah took his cloak and he rolled it up and he struck the water. And the water of the Jordan River was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them could go over it on dry ground. Now when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they went still on, and they talked, behold, chariots of fire, and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. <clears throat> into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes, and he tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that has fallen from him, and he went back and he stood on the bank of the Jordan River. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and he struck the water saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other. And Elisha went over. Let's pray. <coughs> Again, our Lord, this morning, we thank you for the light of your word. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to us now, that you will open our eyes to behold wonderful things in your word, and that we would hear from you as your spirit speaks to our hearts and our minds and addresses us by your word, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've been with us, you know that we're working our way through the books of 1st and 2nd Kings in a series that I'm referring to simply as Kings. And if you've been with us, you know it's because historically this was one book. 
These were not originally two books. They seem to fill two historic Jewish scrolls. So we now call them First and Second Kings. But one of the things that we miss when we don't hold them together, see this is one work, First Kings and Second Kings, as the book of Kings, is what we see is we're not just at the end of First Kings here, and we're not just at the beginning of Second Kings, as we're reading here this morning. We are at the very center of the book of Kings. We're at the continental divide of this book as it was written, as God intended for us to read it as one whole arc and story. And what we see here is that this book is not simply about the kings of Israel and Judah, although they are kind of the organizing factor of the overall book. But this is much more than just a history of the people of Israel. This is a prophetic interpretation of what has gone before so that the people of God could understand what God has done in their history and indeed for them in particular why judgment came on the land of Israel. And so the organizing principle is the various kings of the north and the south as these histories are interwoven. Israel to the north and Judah to the south but also as we've seen it's not simply the kings that are highlighted but with almost every king that comes along, it's one of the prophets that comes along to confront them, to challenge them. For the very few that were godly and followed the Lord, they were there to support them and to encourage them and to carry them through. But nonetheless, we see God confronting his people through the prophets, through the ministry of the prophetic word. Indeed, not only to the people in general, but to those in the highest levels of authority the kings themselves. They are not unaccountable laws unto themselves, but indeed they answer to the king of kings. They answer to the Lord of lords. And so this is, as you will, the overarching theme of the book of Kings as we are encountering it. And if you were here last week, you know, we met a prophet by the name of Micaiah. And this was the la one of the last prophets to really confront the king Ahab. And as we saw, they invited him. They said, we want to hear the word of the Lord. And yet when he brought it, what was their reply? The king and all in his court and around him, they struck him. They ridiculed him. They pressured him. They threw him into prison. And then this was the outcome of his ministry. He was called to speak the truth. He was called to obey God rather than men. And this is the way the world replies to him. And so it goes throughout all of history. We see this in the Old Testament. We see it in the New. When God's word comes through God's people, even all the way to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who was the word of God in human flesh, when God is revealed to humanity, what happens is we strike him. We resist him. We throw him into prison. And we see this time and again, not only in the pages of the Bible, but indeed also across the pages of church history. As you know, we're praying for friends. Uh, we, there's Somali believers right now in Somalia who are in prison right now, awaiting a potential life-threatening verdict, separated from the ch their children and family. And if you've been around, you know we're praying for them. Perhaps you know about Christians currently in communist China or in North Korea. And what they're facing right now is they are literally this morning sitting in prison and faced with a death penalty if, uh, if, you know, or else they may never get out. Not only that, if you are, depending on, you know, the latest news you may have heard yesterday, just about a thousand miles to our north in Calgary and in Alberta, Canada, right now, Churches are being shut down, confiscated, and there are pastors literally in prison this morning in our neighbors to the north, Canada. You might think we were just talking about communist China, but I'm talking about the red maple leaf, not to pick on Canada this morning, okay? But this is a little closer to home. These are literally, yesterday a pastor got hauled off in handcuffs because he was holding a church service of more than 15 people. Say what you will about the various restrictions on the coronavirus or whatever, but 
for a government to throw pastors in prison or, or Christians in prison. This is happening around the world right now. This is not just 3,000 years ago in some dusty old book. God himself is addressing our world through his people, through his word. And what's happening is our world strikes, us, strikes God in the mouth, resists God. And we see that here, and we see it on the pages of the news playing out here before us. If you don't know what I'm talking about, about Canada, feel free to Google it and uh, to look it up. I want to invite you this morning. Um, you know, we, I think, grow familiar with the ideas of the persecutions in Africa or China or communist nations even today around the world. But when it gets to the point of Canada and friends like that that are so close to our own culture, um, it's even closer to home. Now, you know, our friends in a Somali prison are as close as the Canadians, are as close as the next door neighbors, because we're all made of the same stuff. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? And so I want to encourage you to be praying for all of them, but in particular, as this is playing out in Canada right now, uh, there's a lot going on, and I would invite you to, I wanted to highlight that this morning and invite you to be praying for them, not only this morning, but also in the days ahead. So, but as we are working our way through the books of Kings, like we saw last time, God is not at all intimidated by the rebellion of mankind. God is not at all intimidated by the resistance of humanity to himself, to his word, to his people, although he does certainly take it to heart, as we'll see here in this text this morning. You know, Jesus said this. He said, fear not uh, the man for man who can harm your flesh, who can take your life. All they can do, all humanity can do is, at worst, take your life from you. That's it. So Jesus says, don't worry about that. Here's who you should fear. The one who, after he kills you, can throw you into a hell of fire. Okay, the Lord God Almighty. There's one we should fear, and that is God himself. Amen? Amen. Okay, so this is some of the themes of the books of First and Second Kings. And so we should fear not. Because what we face, if the world were to take our liber liberties, cast us in jail, and indeed, worst case, take our lives... They're frankly only doing us a favor because they're going to usher us into the immediate presence of Almighty God, which goes on for all eternity. Amen? Right. And so that's why Jesus said, if you're persecuted, your response should be to celebrate because they're doing you an eternal favor, mounting up reward that you could never conceive of or imagine. If we only had eyes to see eternity, if we could only see God for who he is and the eternal reward that awaits those that trust him and follow him, we would not be swayed at all by any fear on earth. And yet, we're frail human beings, just like the people in the Bible. And just like the people in the Bible, the Lord Jesus himself would say, fear not, I'm with you. And if they take your life, that is the worst they can do. All right? Okay, so that's sort of the way to view it all. And so I want to encourage you to be praying for your brothers and sisters, um, even this morning, that are likely uh, sitting in prison around the world, even as close as Canada. Canada. Um, because here's the but here's the reality. Even as we saw last week, if you were with us last week, the reality is that these things are normal in the Christian life. This is just the normal part of the Christian life. Because God is at work in you, if you're trusting in Christ and following Jesus, there is a miracle going on where God is at work in you, and then he is, the reason you're still here is because he has purposes for you. He is at work not only in you, for you privately, but he is also molding, shaping you, whether you can see it or not, and he's working through you to the world around you. And it's prophetic in nature. You know, there are people that come along like the Elijah and Elisha. And they get big bill in the Bible. And we talk about them rightly in the story of God's world. But the reality is there's a way in which prophetically God is at work in and through his people even now. 
prophetically speaking to the world around us, beckoning us to recognize and acknowledge him for who he is and what he's like, for all that he's done, to realize there's accountability for God. And as you live the normal Christian life, it's an example to the world about the way God operates in the lives of broken, sinful people just like you and just like me. So these are some of the themes, again, that we're picking up here in the books of First and Second Kings. We have already met Elijah to this point. We've met and seen his various clashes with King Ahab in particular, which is to say we're seeing Ahab's clashes with the Lord God Almighty as demonstrated through his prophet Elijah. We have briefly met Elisha, but here we get a closer glimpse of Elisha who is to succeed, so to be the su successor of Elijah and in his place going forward. And so what we've seen is that, uh, well, let me see this. So uh, earlier on we saw Elisha anointed by the prophet Elijah, but we've not seen much more of him yet. But then here in chapter 2, verse 1, that we read just a little bit earlier, we see the setup to begin the beginning, the end of Elijah's story, and the beginning of Elisha's story, as we've read in chapter 2. And again, it says this, this is the context in verse 1. The Lord was about to take away Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind. Now, we don't know exactly what manner in which, how, how they all knew that this was about to happen. Well, what's clear is that the Lord had made it known to Elijah and Elisha and the sons of the prophets. You hear that over and again. And that just means those that were being raised up, trained, taught, uh, called by God, and also trained by the various prophets, the sons of the prophets, they were being raised up to serve as prophets in the land of Israel. Somehow or another, they know, and we're not told exactly how, but what we find is in verse 6 and following, I want to just read through this again because it's, it's just where I'm going to give my comment here to the end. Beginning toward the end of verse 6, it says, So the two of them, Elijah and Elisha, they went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went, and they stood at some distance from them as both were standing by the Jordan River. Now, what's interesting, it's, if you don't know the, the I, so literally, I had a map and some slides that I was going to show you all of this, and I sent the soundboard the wrong thing. And so, uh, anyway, I don't have a map to refer to, so use your imagination, okay? If you don't already know the map of Israel really well, let me just describe it to you. As they go from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho, away from Samaria in the north. They're not going to, like, Jerusalem in the south. They're actually leaving the promised land. In fact, they're taking the exact route out of the promised land that many years before Joshua led God's people into the promised land for the first time. So there's, I think, prophetically a statement about the glory of God departing from his land. Judgment is setting in on the land of Israel. Even as it is entered in through this path, it, they are now exiting the promised land for the grand finale of the prophet Elijah's life and ministry. And so this is happening. They're now standing at the Jordan River about to, to leave and depart the land of Israel sort of officially. And they're standing on the bank of the Jordan River. In verse 8, Elijah took out his cloak, which is a representative of his authority and his prophetic ministry, and he wraps it up and he strikes the water of the Jordan River, and amazingly, what happens? Just the only, one of the only times in the entire Bible when this kind of a thing happens, it happens a few times, and this is the last, one of the last times, where the waters part and separate, and they go over on dry land. Now, what does that remind you of? What comes to mind when Elijah strikes the water and it parts? I don't know if you know or not, the Jordan River is not huge, this was a flood stage, so it was bigger than normal, but maybe maybe something like the Colorado River. You know, they could have swam. You know, sometimes I read this, say, it's not the Red Sea. They could have got over. What, what's going on here? Some people would say, well, it didn't happen. This is make-believe, okay? 
And what the Bible clearly says is he struck the water and the waters parted. What's it called a month? Ever hear of a man named Moses? Moses and the Red Sea, right? The army of Pharaoh was bearing down on them and the Lord said, go forward into the sea. I will deliver you as you do. And they stepped in the water and what happened is the waters parted and God's people went over on dry land. This is supposed to call that to mind because what we're supposed to see in like big glowing letters is like, notice, you know, look, see here. God, this is unique. This is significant. This doesn't happen apart from a massive divine intervention of God. And so something significant is going on here. And we've talked about this, that Elijah and Elisha, their ministries here at the pinnacle, at the continental divide of the book of Kings, is right here. It's, how, it's not just about the kings of Israel. This is about the king of kings, the Lord God Almighty, who's the king of heaven and earth, who's the king of Israel and the king of all kings in all lands and all nations. And he has come down to make himself known. And you see the waters part. They go over on dry land. And the next thing is they're talking and they're chatting. And, and Elijah says, hey, is there anything I can do for you before I'm taken up? This is verse 9. Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit put on me as you go. He said, you ask a hard thing. Uh, you know, it's not even mine to give. If you see me when I go, the Lord will bestow that on you. Now, in Deuteronomy, in the Law of Moses, it talks about the, the double portion of the firstborn. And I think what we see here is Elijah and Elisha, they have this relationship. It's like Elijah is Elisha's father in the faith, and he's asking for kind of his inheritance, his spiritual inheritance from his spiritual father. And nonetheless, what happens is these chariots of fire, they swoop in, separate them, take Elijah up into heaven. You know, Elijah had, had he'd reached a point of despair and fear when Queen Jezebel threatened his life. And he despaired. He said, you know, he ran for his life. He thought, I'm going to lose my life. And the thing that he feared never happened to him. He never, the queen never caught him. He never lost his life somehow or another. The Lord translated him by these chariots of fire. And nonetheless, Elisha saw it all. And we know this double portion of Elijah's spirit, kind of the anointing and the ministry on him comes and falls upon Elisha. Even the cloak of Elijah falls to the ground. It's symbolic kind of in the real world of uh, the anointing that was on Elijah coming on Elisha. And, uh, and this, is, this is the way the story continues. And so I want to just read to the end. Elijah, Elisha takes the cloak. This is um, verse 14. He takes the cloak and he struck the water of the Jordan. And he says, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck it, the waters, just like they had for Elijah, the waters part. And they go over on the other side. And Elisha went on his way. And Elisha begins his ministry, which, Lord willing, next time we'll dive into that a little more. But there's really two things that I want to call to mind here. There's so much I could say about this. And a lot I'm not going to say. I would encourage you to read this and reflect upon it for yourself, as I always would encourage you to do. But there's two main things I want to highlight, and then a third point that I want to make for Mother's Day. Okay, so uh, first off, Elisha asked for this double portion, uh, this portion of the firstborn, I think, based off the law of Moses. And what we see is when that's given to him, the author of the book of Kings is very intentional to show that that was the case. As you read the story of Elisha, what you see is that he has twice as many acts of power and miracles that come through his life and ministry as did the prophet Elijah, as far as what's recorded. Now, they may have done things that aren't recorded here, but nonetheless, the author of the book of Kings shows specifically twice as many miracles that are performed in the ministry of Elisha as were in the ministry of Elijah. By my count, it was eight for Elijah and 16 for Elisha. And so what we see kind of within the book itself is displaying that the Lord granted that request. Secondly, this crossing of the Jordan River and especially with the parting of the waters 
it calls to mind Moses, and I think we're supposed to see Elijah and even Elisha's ministry kind of continuing the ministry of Elijah is hearkening back in one hand to the time of Moses. And, and frankly, and I've talked about this before, we see Elijah and we see Moses again in the future. When was that? When Jesus was about to go to the cross and he took a few disciples up on the mount, what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. He took a few disciples. They went up on this mountain and for just a moment, the divine nature of Jesus was fully unveiled. Before this, he was just, he was fully God, as the Bible teaches, yet he lived fully as a man. If you looked at him, you would see a man. If you touched him, you would feel a man. If you interacted with him, you would interact with a man. But for this one brief moment, it's like the curtain was pulled back and the glory, the eternal glory of Jesus shined through. And they were in the glory cloud of God's presence just covered the mountain. And they all sort of, you know, cowered in fear before the majesty of Jesus. And who did they see? They saw not only Jesus, but they saw Elijah and Elisha talking with Jesus about the departure he was about to make on the cross. And so we see not only that Moses talked about Jesus and Elijah foreshadows Jesus, but we also see that the Lord brought them to the point of Jesus suffering to help encourage and strengthen him in reality. And that's a story for another time, but I get excited about that one. But there's another thing that this parting of the Jordan points to, and I've already alluded to it, but it was the initial crossing of God's people into the promised land when the waters also parted for Joshua and the people of Israel. They've been roaming in the wilderness for 40 years, 40 years after the Lord had parted the Red Sea, and they're here about to go across the Jordan River, and again, they're at flood stage, and what happens? For Joshua, the waters parted, and they entered in. Here the waters part again for Elijah and Elisha. And what we see, I think, especially in the crossing of Elijah, I've already alluded to this, got ahead of my notes, but what we have here is the beginning of the end, not only of the ministry of Elijah, but of what God has been doing in the land of Israel. He's been pleading with his people. That's why the prophetic word of God comes, either through individuals or through his word or by the voice of the spirit in our hearts is to challenge us, to confront us, that we might see and behold him, that we might respond to God. I mean, God's word's clear. If you hear his voice, how do you reply? We don't say, oh, well, that was me. God talked to me. We respond to the God of heaven and earth. We bow our hearts and perhaps even our bodies. We prostrate ourselves before Almighty God. We say, the Lord has addressed me. And, and in the prophets, God was appealing to his people to turn back to him. If God didn't care, he would have never spoken. He would have just said, have it your way. But generation after generation throughout the, this history, this 500-year history of the season of the kings, the Lord was appealing to his people to turn back to him warning them of what was to come if they did not. And so we see, I think, somewhat of the beginning of the end. And then as we will see as Elisha comes in, Elisha's ministry really begins, I think, sort of the final stages of the last hundred or so years of the life of Israel in the north in particular, a little bit longer to Judah in the south, where the Lord is coming to take away the lampstand of the people of Israel, if you will. He'd already told them time and again, but what happens in the book of 2 Kings, the way we read it, uh, we see a lot of the ministry of Elisha for the next say, eight chapters or more. But then what happens is just like the blur of an avalanche as the various kings come and go and God addresses his people and finally they're hauled off to exile by first the Assyrians and then the Babylonians as God sent them to bring final judgment on his people because they had abandoned him. And they'd abandoned him for generations. And the Lord said, I'm jealous for my glory. And you're not just privileged by your birth. 
You're here because I have placed my mercy on you. My glory rests upon you. And this is about me, not you. And they receive final judgment. And we see that in the pages of the books of Kings, because what we see again is it's not just about the kings. And frankly, it's not just about the prophets. And it's likewise not about the priests that we met in Leviticus or along the way in all these other stories, but it's about the one king, the true king. It's about the one prophet, the true prophet. It's about the one priest, the true priest, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of his people. And we see him as the primary character of all of these stories. Lastly, there's more I could say about that, but this is my Mother's Day sermon <laughs> this morning. Happy Mother's Day, by the way. Um, if you skip ahead, this is one of the weirdest stories in the Bible, and yet, strangely, one of my favorites. And I just want to read it without even fully understanding what's going on here. If you skip ahead in chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, this is Elisha's third miracle, if you will. He went up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and they jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And Elisha turned around and when he saw them, he cursed them. In the name of the Lord, and two she-bears she came out of the woods and tore 42 of those boys. All I got to say is, you know, I remember when I was young, and I'm just glad I didn't run into Elisha because, um, but that's another story. So what happens here? Why, why is that story here? Frankly, I don't even know. It's one of the examples of some of the miracles that went on around the ministry of Elisha, frankly, on the one part, this was a community. Bethel had been one of the first places, places God had revealed himself. This was like a stake in the ground where God had revealed himself to humanity. And now, fast forward in history to this point, and this city was corrupt. This city worshipped false gods, called them Yahweh, worshipped them, demons and idols, called it God. And I think these boys represent the talk of the town. I think they represent the attitude of God's people, even toward the prophetic word. You know, go up, you bald head. Okay, that's sort of funny, but it must have been offensive because Elisha called down fire, basically, on these guys. And whatever happens was these two she-bears come out of the woods, and more or less, it doesn't say it killed them, but it tore and mauled 40-something of them, you know. So, uh, so watch out, guys, you know, and girls, you know, y'all, you uh, come talk to me later if you need some advice on how to refer to bald people. But, but here's the reality, uh, you know, this, the she-bear, you know, uh, Proverbs 17, 12, let a man meet a she-bear robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. So the, the author of Proverbs is saying, there's nothing worse than a fool. But if there was, it would be a she-bear robbed of her cubs. Okay? So, you know, fast forward to America, 21st century, and we call moms typically, like, say, I'm a, you know, I wrote it down, a mama bears, right? Yeah. Not a she-bear. Mama bear. Why, why is that? Because it's kind of this idea that, you know, we, you know, we think of, you know, women certainly as the fair sex, and, you know, the men are out there fighting and carousing, and but it's like, if you mess with my kids, you know, that's sort of the mom's attitude. I'm going to tear you a new one. Okay, like a she-bear robbed of her cubs. I'm going to take it to you. Okay. There's this kind of aggressive protectiveness of children. And this is my main point for the morning. This speaks to us about the nature of God. The way God has made bears. The way God has made mamas. God is passionately protective of his people. God will not suffer for his people to be abused long. The Lord loves and guards and protects and watches over and keeps his people. Such to this point that in the book of 
Acts, in particular when the Lord confronted Saul of Tarsus, who was imprisoning his people, who was, who was persecuting his people. Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appeared to Paul, Saul, and stopped him in his tracks. He said, you're not doing this anymore. He said, who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. Saul could have said, well, I was actually attacking the Christians. I was actually persecuting your people. And Jesus said, no, this is personal. So whether it's the she-bear or the mama bear, at Mother's Day, it's important to remember that God is like this. He is passionately, even aggressively passionate about guarding and protecting and loving his people. And I wanted to leave us with that here this morning. Like a she-bear robbed of her cubs or a mama bear whose children are threatened, Almighty God is surrounding his people. This is the story of God's glory throughout the pages of the Bible, throughout the pages of 1st and 2nd Kings, and primarily what we see again is there is only one God, one king over heaven and earth that ultimately matters. All the others are pretenders to the throne. They only have temporary regional authority, and they're on a short leash, and pretty soon they're going to reach the end of it. Whoever they are, wherever they reign, and we are called to obey the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Like the apostles, when they were thrown in jail, they said, you tell me, should we obey God or man? And they chose to obey the Lord. So my admonition here this morning is if you hear his voice, respond to him. If you hear his voice, give him your allegiance. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray.